copies for you that you can leave with. We want you to know what it is they're asking you on this, okay? So. Okay. Okay. Also, there are light refreshments on the side and the back here, so please free, feel free to go anytime during the talk. Uh, this is very uh, informal here, so um, if you need to get up and get something, uh, please uh, feel free to do so. So uh, why don't we begin with a prayer in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father and maker of all, you adorn all creation with splendor and beauty, and fashion human lives in your image and likeness. Awaken in every heart reverence for the work of your hands, and renew among your people a readiness to respect, nurture, and sustain your precious gift of life, from conception to natural death. Amen. amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, in case you were wondering if this is regarding uh, estate planning or living trusts, we actually did that workshop uh, last time, and it is actually on the website. Please go to stlouisdm.org. D as in David, M as in Mary, stlouisdm.org, click on Ministries, and then you'll see a section, I believe, on the right side, it says Respect Life. It'll, you'll have three links that says Workshop 1, 2, and 3. And Workshop 3 is the one that uh, talks about living trust, estate planning, and so forth. So we're not going to cover that uh, for this talk today. For our uh, purposes, we'll be talking about the Advanced Healthcare Directive uh, line by line, okay, so that we'll have a thorough understanding of how to fill this out. If you have not picked this up yet, uh, please pick up a copy of the Advanced Healthcare Directive. This has been provided to us by the Archdiocese of Los Angeles, and this is a Catholic version of the Advanced Healthcare Directive for us who are Catholics. So, um, and before I get into that, our other speaker who was uh, supposed to lead off uh, our talk today was unable to make it. He's out of state. So he actually uh, offered to uh, give free legal advice concerning this document, okay? Not for other things, but concerning this document and this particular workshop. If you have any legal questions, please contact our uh, Respect Life uh, member, Maurice Kane. Uh, please pick up a copy of this uh, paper. It has his information, it has his office phone. He even gave us his cell phone and the email. So he's, he'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, in terms of uh, legal matters for uh, this advanced health care directive. Okay, and please call between the hours of 8 a.m. and 6 p.m. He requested that you call uh, normal business hours, okay? Uh, because of the, the content of this, there's a lot of content we have to cover. I'm not going to answer any questions until the very end, okay? So if you, if you could please uh, keep your questions until the end. Otherwise, it's going to go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and we'll never get done. So I prefer to complete uh, the, the whole document, and your questions will probably mostly be answered as we go through it um, uh, ourselves, okay? So this is more of a practical thing, and I'll also be talking about uh, church teaching with regards to what to do uh, when, you know, something happens and you have a question about uh, our health care and so forth. So we'll, we'll go through that uh, very generally, but uh, also um, to kind of give us an idea of how to fill this out, okay? So once again, this is a Catholic version of the Advanced Healthcare Directive. If you're not Catholic, this will not apply to you. So you can do the one that the hospital provides you, or you can even create your own, okay? The state of California actually lets you write up your own if you'd like, but this is more comprehensive for our intents and purposes, okay? So Advanced Healthcare Directive, if you need a, uh, another copy of this or multiple copies, please go to Google, okay? Go to Google, type in LA space, Archdiocese, and then these words right here, Advanced Healthcare Directive. The very first link you find will give you an, an online version of this entire document, okay? So LA space Archdiocese, Advanced Healthcare Directive. The very first link, I just tested it like, like an hour ago, okay? <laughs> the very first link, at least it will be for, for the time being, okay? So you can, find, you can find it, you can download it, you can print as many copies as you want, okay? So as I said, this is a legal document that the state of California uh, will uh, honor. If you go to another state, this will not apply. Okay, it's only for us here in California. So why don't we start? Best way to start doing something is let's, let's do it. Okay, so let's go to part one. Uh, if you don't have a pencil, please raise your hand. Anyone have? Nope. Okay, so 
We'll start in part one, power of attorney for healthcare. So this does not mean I'm granting uh, my healthcare power to a lawyer like Maurice Kane. What this means is when I am incapacitated, unconscious, I'm unable to make my own healthcare decisions, okay? This is your primary appointment. So I'm kind of a, I grew up reading the Peanuts comic, comic strip, okay? So pretend I am Charlie Brown. So where it says primary appointment, say I, Charlie Brown, okay? Hereby designate the following individual as my agent to make healthcare decisions for me. So Charlie Brown has a sister named Sally Brown, right? So under print name, he's gonna write Sally Brown, okay? It says print name, Sally Brown. He's gonna put Sally's home number. He's gonna put her work number, the cell phone, and the relationship, he would say sister, okay? Under mailing address, the, the mailing address that um, they live at, okay? So now the Peanuts characters are minors, okay, when you read the comic strip, but let's pretend they're adults. So in terms of this document, you have to be an adult. Me, pretend I'm Charlie Brown, I'm an adult, so this would apply to me. If you are a minor, you, sh you do not need to write this document, okay? And Sally has to be an adult, 18 or over, okay? She must not be an employee or affiliated with your healthcare provider, okay? And she must not be a employee or affiliated with a skilled nursing care that you might happen to be or the person in question for this document, okay? Um, there's actually a checklist at the very last page. It'll give you more details. So I won't go over the details, but that gives you a little bit more details of who can be your primary appointment, who is, who we shall, whom we shall call an agent from now on, okay? So Sally Brown is my primary appointment. She is my agent. So in case I, you know, something happens to me, I'm knocked out cold, I can't make any healthcare decisions on myself, they take me to a hospital, they're going to contact Sally Brown and say, what does Charlie Brown want in terms of his health care? How, how should we proceed? So every question regarding uh, my health care as Charlie Brown, they will refer to uh, Sally, okay? Should be pretty self-explanatory. So go on to the next page, section 1.2. It says, first alternate appointment. What that means is if Sally goes to the hospital and she says, oh, I don't want to make this decision anymore. I, I don't want to do, have anything to do with it, or Sally is all the way in Australia and we can't reach her, or something like that, okay? Then this would be an alternate appointment. So Charlie Brown's best friend is Linus, right? Okay, so he's gonna put down Linus as his first alternate appointment in case Sally is not willing, able, or reasonable, available to make a healthcare decision for me. So, so it's, it's like an alternate, okay? They will go to the next person when Sally's not available or doesn't wanna do it and so forth. So Linus will be, you put, print the name Linus, or wh whoever you want to put. Again, same thing, home number, work phone, cell phone, relationship would be friend, mailing address, and email address, okay? It's pretty straightforward stuff, okay? If you'd like to fill that out now in pencil, that's fine. Otherwise, you can come back to it, and at least you have an idea what that's for, okay? Same thing with second alternate appointment. No mystery here, in case Sally and Linus do not, are not willing, able, or reasonable, available to make healthcare decisions for me as Charlie Brown, then they will go to the second alternate appointment. And Charlie Brown has another friend named Peppermint Patty, okay? <laughs> so Peppermint Patty is a second alternate appointment. They're gonna go to her. I don't think he'll call upon Lucy, you know, so, but <laughs> Peppermint Patty is the alternate appointment. So same thing, print name, Peppermint Patty, home phone number, work, cell, et cetera, okay? If you have other family members that you would like to use besides friends, that's okay too. So that's up to you. You are the one making that decision of who you want as to work on behalf of you as an agent. Now before you put their names down, okay, and before you sign the document, make sure you have a conversation with them. Make sure you talk to Sally and Linus and Peppermint Penny and say, this is an important document for me and I want to abide by Catholic Church teaching, which we'll go in a, in a minute. And I want you to make the decisions that you think I would be making, okay? So obviously euthanasia is off the table, okay? Uh, you say, I don't want any form of assisted suicide no matter how much they push for it and you need to tell the doctor, nurse, whatever, that I don't want this, okay? 
So you have to have that candid conversation, say these are the things that I would want for my healthcare, and it is, you, you're placing your uh, best judgment on them, okay? So don't pick your neighbor that you only see in the morning and say hello, who has no idea who you are, okay? I mean, you can pick them, but is that really the right person you want making healthcare decisions for you, okay? So really do seriously consider who you, who you would want for your primary appointment, your first alternate appointment, and your second alternate appointment, okay? Three people. So 1.4, it says agent's authority. So your agent is authorized to make all healthcare decisions for me, including decisions to provide withhold or withdraw medical treatment to keep me alive, except what you specify in part two. We're gonna to get to part two in a bit, okay? So they have the authority to make decisions on your behalf. Even though you're not conscious, even though you you're, may, may not be in the right state of mind, they're gonna make those decisions. And this section basically says, by law, they have that authority to do so, okay? And this authority, 1.5, it becomes affected Effective when my primary physician determines I am unable to make my own healthcare decisions. For example, as I mentioned, if I'm unconscious, if I'm in a coma, if I am not of sound mind, okay, the primary physician will say, <clears throat> this person cannot make their own healthcare decisions, so they're going to look at this document, go to your primary appointment, your uh, first alternate and second alternate to make those decisions for you, okay? Straightforward once again. Now, obligation 1.6. My agent shall make healthcare decisions for me in accordance with this power of attorney for healthcare, meaning this document. My, any instructions I give in part two, which we'll just cover in a minute. And my other wishes to the extent known to my agent. Again, that comes from your candid conversation of what you talked about, okay? To the extent of my wishes are unknown, my agent shall make healthcare decisions for me in accordance with my, what my agent determines to be in my best interest. So you want, again, you want someone that would have your best interest in mind, okay? And my agent shall consider my personal values, meaning for us as Catholics, okay, my Catholic religious values would be part of those personal values to the extent known to my agent, okay? So make sure they do know you're Catholic, okay? It's very important. Uh, 1.7, what agent's post-death authority means is after you pass or um, you're incapacitated, you can't make this, this decision, your agent is actually authorized to what it says anatomical gifts means they can donate your organs, okay, your body parts, or they can authorize an autopsy to determine the cause of death, or they can, not or, but and, they can direct the disposition of my remains, meaning where does my body go after I've passed at the hospital. So they actually have that authority, unless you specify otherwise on the following page, which we'll, we'll get in a moment, okay. Part two. Instructions for healthcare. 2.1, healthcare decisions should be made consistent with Catholic teaching. Again, this is a document for us Catholics. So any decision concerning my healthcare should be consistent with relevant teachings of the Roman Catholic Church, which are summarized on the first page. So let's go back to the first page. And there's a reason why this is on the first page, because this is all the Catholic, Catholic teaching regarding um, concerning euthanasia, but also for um, most things regarded to our healthcare. So this is probably the most important part of this document, not legally, but for us as Catholics of what we need to know and do. So the first line says, death is a normal part of the human condition. That should not be a surprise for us, okay? Because we, are, we have mortal, finite bodies. We are all going to die someday, okay? We're all gonna die, that's a, that's a fact of life, okay? So death is a normal part. So what that means is, you know, neither to be feared or avoided at all costs, nor to be sought or directly procured. So if we are in the process of dying, okay, we as Catholic Christians, we should not be afraid, okay, because Christ gave us the promise of resurrection. We all know that, okay, I'm not gonna go into that. But, okay, at the same time, it is not to be avoided at all costs. So you do not have a moral obligation to do everything under the sun to try to keep yourself alive, okay? I'll get into that in more detail, but you don't have to, for example, go through experimental treatment. You do not have to pump yourself with a thousand different drugs, hoping that that'll keep you alive a couple more days longer. No, it's, it's a process of natural death, okay? Like I said, our bodies are mortal and they have a limit, 
Okay? They do have a limit, and the, the, the Catholic Church is not opposed to having that natural process of death. And I'll get into that more specifics in a bit. But so euthanasia is wrong. So let's read that together, okay? Euthanasia is wrong. Euthanasia is not permitted. Euthanasia is defined as the intentional ending of human life or act or omission in order to receive relief suffering. Okay, so that includes whether voluntary or involuntary, meaning that by any direct act to kill another human being is considered euthanasia. By omission of an act that could save their life, that um, by ordinary means, okay, that is also a, a form of euthanasia. For instance, let's say, um, okay, morphine, the example of morphine. Morphine is a wonderful uh, drug for a lot of people, okay, it relieves pain, okay. But if you give an overdose of morphine, what happens? You die. You kill that person. See, we don't do that, okay? <laughs> we don't pump ourselves so full of morphine that it causes our death, okay? That, that is a direct cause of death um, for the purpose of euthanizing that person. If it happens as an accidental dose, which shouldn't happen anymore because we have so many sophisticated ways of you know, monitoring that, okay? But if that were to happen, okay, that's not, that wasn't a direct, uh, intention to kill that person, okay? So intentional ending, the intention is the key. If my primary intention is to kill this person, okay? If Sally says, I want to kill Charlie Brown because he's suffering, I want him to die today because I don't want to see that suffering anymore. That's intentional killing, no matter what the means are, okay? Because if, you, if I take a patient and I get a surgical knife and I cut their throat, people will be like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, you can't do that. That's terrible. You're killing that person. But then you say, okay, I get an injection. I stick it in their IV, a little bit of too much morphine, and they pass away. Then all of a sudden it's like, oh, that was peaceful. They, they passed on. <laughs> Do you see the disconnect there? It doesn't matter the means, okay? It doesn't matter the method of delivery. It may, what matters is the intention. I intend to kill that person. So whether it's by a surgical knife, whether it's through a syringe, I intended to kill that person. It's both wrong. It's euthanasia, okay? So just because I use a knife and it's bloody and I'm appalled, okay, being appalled is not <laughs> the de what defines it to be, you know, murder, okay? It's still murder in both ways, okay? At least in the Catholic Church teaching, okay? I, I won't get into this state, but anyways. So we know as Catholics, euthanasia is wrong, okay? Pain relief, okay, pain relief, I, I just mentioned the example of morphine. Pain relief is not a bad thing, okay? If you are in pain and you need something to help alleviate that pain, by all means, you can take uh, medication that will help you uh, manage that pain. But again, if your primary intent is to say, I want to pump myself so full, uh, so full of drugs that I want to die, okay, you can't do that, okay? But if, there, if it happens to be a secondary effect, that's not your fault, okay? But... Um, I lost my train of thought, excuse me. <laughs> okay, so pain relief is not necessarily a bad thing is what I'm trying to say. But again, intention, intention is the key, okay? Um, and when it comes to other forms of drugs, okay, that one you kind of have to discuss with your family, your doctor, okay? Is this drug, drug going to give me benefit or was this, will this drug cause me more harm? So um, in the past, there were drugs that would alleviate pain, which is a good thing, but it might have the secondary effect of decreasing your lifespan, okay? Our, our modern drugs don't do that as much. We've come, we've advanced, but if there is such a drug, there might be in the future, that it will uh, shorten your lifespan, okay? But that is not your primary intent you are actually permitted to take that drug for the purpose of alleviating your pain, which should be your primary intent, okay? You want to alleviate the suffering you're feeling or it, you feel that it will give you some benefit, but the side effect is it might shorten your lifespan, okay? Then in that case, you'd be permitted. If my primary intent is I know the secondary effect is going to shorten my, li my lifespan, but I'm going to take as much of it as I can so that I'll die quicker, faster, at an earlier date, that would not be permitted. 
Okay, you see the difference between the two? Again, it always comes to my intent, okay? Sort of like the whole mortal sin, venial sin, okay, if you remember your catechism, okay? So now we come to proportionality of life-sustaining medical treatment. So there are thousands of different scenarios. Each one is unique. Every patient is unique. So I, I, I can't take questions on that. I'll be happy to answer questions after this. Uh, the, our, our speakers are done. I'd be happy to address uh, specific scenarios because there are so many different variables and so many different uh, things that it, it'll just take up too much time. So I'd be happy to talk to you afterwards. But just to give you a general idea, in terms of proportionality, what it means is, okay, what are the risks or burdens versus what are the benefits of this treatment? So think of a scale, okay? Think of a scale that has risks and burdens versus benefits. So if I'm going to take a drug, okay, and it's going to actually help me, like antibiotics, okay? You are, you, you, the, the, this idea of proportionality is these antibiotics are going to help me. They're going to actually cure me and make me feel better. But the side effect is I'm going to feel not so great or my hair is going to fall off, something like that, okay, some, some, some side effect, okay. In terms of proportionality, it, it, it's pretty good on the benefit side, right, okay. So, but if, if I'm taking a drug that's so risky, an experimental drug, and I have a 90% chance I'm going to die taking this drug, okay, <laughs> that's a huge risk, huge burden, and the benefit is 10%. Am I morally obligated to take that drug? No, I'm not. I'm not, okay? So that's, that's this idea of proportionality. You, you, you kind of use a balance scale in your mind. Do the benefits, do the benefits outweigh the uh, risks and the burdens, okay? And again, every scenario is different. Every scenario is unique. Uh, a good example of this, a concrete example is if I am, um, if I am unable to eat, okay, and I have a feeding tube, okay, do I need to keep that feeding tube on? Well, it depends, okay. If I have stage four terminal cancer and my body is shutting down, no, because your body can't take in that nutrition anymore. Your body is naturally, remember natural death, is naturally shutting down and you just can't take any more. Okay, there comes a point where our bodies just can't receive that nutrition, no matter how much you pump full of drugs or, or artificially or so on, okay? But if I am um, in a vegetative state, okay, I'll talk about that in a minute. If I am in a vegetative state, what are the benefits? It's going to keep me alive, right? Even though I might not be conscious, it's going to keep me alive. If I don't take it, I will die, okay? I'm going to die regardless whether I take it. Or, I'm sorry, I will die regardless when I don't take it, okay? If I don't receive that nutrition, that hydration, that uh, nourishment from uh, food that comes through that tube, I will die, okay? That's a fact, I am going to die. So that's that level of proportionality, okay? So when you're in stage four, or you have a very serious terminal illness, you have to, again, the benefit versus the uh, risks and burdens, okay? I hope that makes sense. So that kind of ties in with uh, the, the next section where it says nutrition, hydration of food and water. We are actually obligated, okay, the Archbishop has actually written a little uh, booklet that he says we are to um, uh, elaborate that uh, even a feeding tube is where we are obligated to receive artificially because it's nutrition, it is hydration. Our bodies cannot produce food and water, okay? We cannot produce it on our own. We need an external source to receive it. So a feeding tube, we are actually morally obligated unless, okay, the example I have given. If you're terminally ill and it gives you no benefit, that benefit just plummets, there's no use for me to take that, then by all means, you don't have to be on that feeding tube. You, you just don't because your body just can't take it, okay? Another example, okay, um, people ask me this a lot. So if a person, a patient, me, Charlie Brown, I'm, I'm in a coma and I'm on a ventilator, okay? which is an artificial tube that pumps air into my lungs so that I can breathe, okay? If I am in a coma, I need that air, right? Okay, I need that air, but, okay, so <laughs> here's where it gets a little tricky, okay? If I had made my uh, wishes known to Sally that I said, it causes me great horror 
to be on a ventilator if I'm in a coma for the rest of my life. And you, you relay that information to her. Or you've actually put that in here. I do not want to be on a ventilator if I were to be in a coma for a long period of time, and so forth, OK? So ventilators are supposed to be short-term solutions to help you breathe. The longer you have a ventilator, the longer you have a chance of getting an infection, OK? It's not natural the way a ventilator works of how to make you breathe. So you are not morally obligated to be on a ventilator if, you, if it causes you, it's called horror vehemence, OK? It is this concept of, in, in moral theology that if the idea of being on a ventilator, ventilator causes you so much horror and so much like, ah, I, can't, I can't find myself being in that position, then you are not obligated to be on it, OK? If it's a short-term solution, of course you should. If it's just temporary to help you to breathe until your lungs are able to breathe on its own, okay? So when the ventilator is removed, we're not killing that person because their lungs, if their lungs are not able to breathe on their own, that is part of natural death. Does that make sense? It's part of natural death because your lungs can't take it. You're not killing that person directly, okay? That is not your intention, okay? And it should not be your intention here that uh, because I want to die. No, it is because it causes me such great horror, I cannot find myself being hooked up to a ventilator for 30 years, OK? You have, you're not morally obligated to do that. But in terms of your loved ones, if they're in a car accident and they need to be on a ventilator so that their lungs can recuperate and heal so that they can, OK, be better, then of course they should be on it, OK? But again, that's meant to be a short-term solution, not a long-term one. So consultation with medical, <coughs> excuse me, consultation with medical and spiritual advisors. Again, it's good to talk with your doctors, all the medical staff, and spiritual advisors. If you uh, have any questions when you call in the priest or uh, someone who, uh, usually most hospitals have hospital chaplains also, so you can ask them questions as well. If you're at a Catholic hospital, even better, um, there should be a priest or or a lay person who is Catholic that will be on duty that can help you with any questions then. So. Um, where it says more detailed guidance is available. The document that is listed here where it says declaration on euthanasia in italics is actually this document. So you have this document with you. If you don't, please pick one up. Okay, this was uh, propagated by the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith from Rome. It is slightly outdated, but the, inf the, uh, the content is not. So it still applies to us today. Um, <clears throat> so please make sure to take home a copy of this and read it. And also there is a, a trifold. Uh, oh, it's not folded, sorry. Okay. Okay. This, this is more information about the advanced healthcare directive that we have just discussed. A little bit more detail. The print is a little smaller, but um, <clears throat> that's for your information also. And this actually refers to an item in the checklist uh, I believe it's number 10 on your checklist is what it's referring to here, okay? So let me spend, this is I think important, a few more minutes on our making better healthcare decisions. How do you know when someone has died, okay? Because they stopped breathing, because they're, they're not able to move, they don't speak, they don't open their eyes, their pupils are dilated. What do we use as Catholics as a measurement to determine how or when a person has died? Well, we have to understand, okay, the heart can beat through the help of machines. Our lungs can breathe through the help of machines, and other organs can function with the help of machines, even without the usage of brain activity, okay? But we have to understand, okay, our brain is split up into um, uh, just very basic biology or anatomy of the human body. We have the brain, okay, the cerebrum is the, the biggest part. It's broken into four lobes. It's the largest part of our brain is the part that's kind of underneath our head right here, okay? And that part of our brain uh, processes our reasoning, our thoughts, our emotions, our feelings, our, our uh, speech, and our perception, okay? That's the top part of the brain. 
There's another part of that top part. There's a little part called, the, in layman's terms, the little brain that's underneath the cerebrum, and it's called the cerebellum. And in the cerebellum, that part of the brain determines our, move, our coordinates, our movement, our, our posture, our motor functions, okay, our, our movement, basically how our body moves. That's what the cerebellum does. And the other part that gets overlooked is the brain stem. So think of a, a stalk of broccoli, cauliflower, you know, that stem part. Okay, our brains have that stem part. And that's the least complex part of our brains, but it handles our, our blood pressure, our breathing, our heartbeat, and so forth. So when you're in a, in a uh, hospital situation and the doctor tells you, this patient, Charlie Brown, has severe brain damage and will probably never recover, okay? They have brain damage. It doesn't mean that they have brain death, okay? At least in the Catholic Church teaching, a person has not died until they have experienced brain death. Not one part of the brain in the cerebrum, not the second part of the cerebellum, not just the brainstem. All three parts have to seize activity. There is no blood flow through all parts of the brain, not just one part. All parts of the brain have to seize activity. There's no electrical activity. There's no blood flow. So the medical profession will be able to give you that information. There are tests and there, there are other ways that they can determine this. Do not trust the doc. I don't, I don't mean it that way, but don't trust the medical profession who just says, oh, yeah, they're dead. They're dead. They're, they're not coming back. You got to ask them, have they experienced brain death? Okay? Brain death is irreversible. They can never come back from that. Their heart can beat. Their lungs can function through the help of a machine, but if their brain is dead, they've gone, okay? They passed on, at least in, Catholic, in, in terms of Catholic teaching, okay? So that's how you can determine that your loved one has passed when you ask, has that person experienced brain death, okay? So that's very, an important question to ask the medical staff there. Has, has, has my loved one experienced brain death? And, and they can determine that for you, okay? So going back to what a vegetative state is, okay? A vegetative state is a clinical condition of complete unawareness of the self and of the environment that is accompanied by one distinguishing clinical feature, sleep-wake cycles. So what that means is there will be moments where a patient might open their eyes or there might be some random movement with their fingers, their hands, their legs, and so forth. So they'll go through that period and then they'll seem like they're sleeping again. So it's like a sleep and awake cycle. And it's kind of random, and you don't, you're not able to predict when it happens. But is that person dead? No. Okay. In terms of Catholic Church teaching, that person is not dead. They're just in a vegetative state, meaning that um, the major parts of their brain are maybe there's no blood flow to certain parts but there is blood flow and electrical activity in other parts of the brain. They're still alive, okay? So we should not consider them just because they're in an unconscious state, okay, and they're not aware of, their, of the self or, or surroundings, it does not mean that they're not alive, okay? It's like when we go to sleep, are we alive when we're asleep? Of course we're alive. We're sleeping, but we're still alive, okay? And, and Archbishop Jose made this wonderful analogy saying, if you go to a person who's sleeping or unconscious and I kill them, is that murder? Yeah, it's murder. Still murder, okay? So what's the difference between that and euthanizing someone? If you don't see the difference, then what can I say? But we as Catholics should be able to see there is no difference, whether you're asleep, whether you're unconscious, whether you're in a coma. So going to being a coma, what's the difference between a vegetative state and a coma? A coma is not the same as a vegetative state. A coma involves a a deep unconsciousness, okay, that persists for at least one hour. So if, if a person is unconscious for 30 minutes, they're not in a coma. It has to be at least an hour, okay? So when someone is in a coma, they, are, they don't have that sleep-wake cycle where they might suddenly open their eyes or they might start moving their hands and so forth. So a coma is more like they're asleep and they're, they have, they're not able to wake up at all for any period of time, okay? So comas can lead to a complete recovery, a partial recovery, or comas can end up becoming a persistent vegetative state, and in um, the worst case, it'll end in death. And 
There is a distinction between comas that patients experience themselves versus a medically induced coma. Now, this is a coma that's induced by a doctor, surgeon, because they want to um, place them in a state where um, <clears throat> it's basically to protect them, for instance, when they have an injury to their brain. And uh, they have to protect the patient so that they have higher survivability when they're going through surgery or any procedure. So it, it's, it's medically induced probably through, uh, I, again, I'm not a doctor, okay, so, but um, my guess is through drugs or some other form of uh, um, medicine that the person is induced, okay, but they are able to be uh, woken up through those same means, okay? So medically induced doesn't mean they're going to be in a coma forever. They're just temporarily placed. So if a, if a doctor asks you, can we medically induce your loved one to, uh, so that they can have surgery and have a higher survivability, then you, uh, have, you are better informed of what that is, okay? So going back to proportionality, okay, you might ask, what's proportionate and what's disproportionate? So a person has a moral obligation to use ordinary or proportionate means to preserve your life. Antibiotics, uh, if I need Tylenol, if I need a fever reducer or some other form, or if I need something, um, if I need a, uh, a, a member of the medical staff to put gauze and you know, put pressure on, on my leg because I'm going to bleed to death if I don't. Those are ordinary means. You are obligated to receive that health care, okay? And proportionate means are also those that in the judgment of the patient, you, that they will offer a reasonable hope of benefit. And they won't, okay, here's another thing. It will also not entail an excessive burden or excessive expense on the family. If something might seem reasonable, okay, if this treatment might seem reasonable to me as Charlie Brown, but it's going to put Sally in the poorhouse. She'll have to do a double mortgage. She has to sell everything uh, that she owns. That would not be proportional, okay? It's an excessive burden for her. In that case, you are not morally obligated to take that treatment, okay? Does that make sense, okay? Because it, it, it is so burdensome to her, to your family, and your family members. Uh, for, so sort of like if you're in a poor uh, city or poor country and you simply cannot afford to uh, uh, receive certain levels of care, even though they might be considered normal here, you are not morally obligated if, if it will cause an excessive burden for them. Okay? Even though it might seem ordinary uh, means, if, if it per places that burden, you are not morally obligated. Should you? If you can, you should, but again, you don't have to, is, is what, we're, what the church is saying in regards to that. So anything that is disproportionate is the opposite of that. That treatment, in your, in your uh, judgment, it does not offer a reasonable hope of benefit, or it will entail an excessive burden, as I've just uh, explained. Okay. I, I think there was a workshop that discussed palliative care. I, I don't think we have to go over that. If you need more questions on palliative care, I believe it's workshop one, okay, go to the link that I described, go to workshop one, um, and then um, that goes over what hospice and palliative care is about. And those are supported by the church so long as the treatment itself is not primarily intended to cause your death, okay, for euthanasia or assisted suicide. Okay, that was a mouthful. So let's now go back to part two. We're going to fill out the rest of the form. Part 2, 2.2, end-of-life decisions. So it says here, it's impossible to adequately anticipate all the considerations which must be weighed at the time when a decision concerning life-sustaining treatment is to be made. Therefore, I have appointed an agent, Sally Brown, uh, that I have full confidence in her judgment, and I request that my health care providers follow her instructions. It's basically just legally saying that, <clears throat> um, that you've chosen Sally to, to uh, do your end-of-life decisions. It's just to put it in print of, of what her role is. So 2.3 is special instructions, okay? Special instructions is optional, but uh, as Catholics, we should actually do write something within here. Okay, it says the following lines may be used to set forth any further directions, limitations, or statements concerning healthcare treatment services and procedures. So on these lines, please be more specific rather than general. 
If you say, I do not want any extraordinary means for my health care, that depends on the doctor's uh, definition of what that is. So you're up to the mercy of the doctor what that will be. So it's better to be specific. CPR, for instance. <clears throat> CPR is used for nor normally. Its intention is for those who are reasonably healthy, okay, adults, um, and those who are not. Uh, for instance, if you are elderly or you have a specific bone disease, CPR will crack and break your ribs, and it will worsen your health condition. Okay, so that's up to you if you think that the benefit outweighs the risk or burden in that sense. Okay? If you do not write that down, they will always do CPR on you. Okay? They're obligated to. Same as when they call 911, first thing they're going to do is they're going to try to do CPR on you unless you have specific instructions or they, you know, you got to have this. Okay? That's the importance of this. If you don't want CPR because my bro all my bro brittle bones are going to be crushed and it's going to kill me, you better you know, darn well write that in here, that you have that condition, no CPR, please, okay? So that's a special condition. If you're reasonably healthy, of course, you won't have to write that in, and they will perform CPR on you, okay? <clears throat> Again, uh, there are other, uh, like a ventilator, that was another example I had mentioned earlier, okay? It's, again, that's a temporary thing. It's not something long-term, and if, if that causes you such great horror that you don't want that, if you were in a specific instance of being in a coma, and you say, I don't want it for the next 30 years, and be a burden, financial burden to my family, then please write that in specifically for that instance. If you do not have room here, there's only, I think, three lines. There's a little section that says, continue on page five if necessary. So let's turn to page five. Okay, and lo and behold, it says, space for additional limitations and or instructions. So there's more space here. If you need even more space, you can uh, create another page and say, please see attachments uh, something something. You can name your attachment and say, please see attachment one regarding that. So you can make as many of these as you like. Uh, <coughs> or uh, if you need more lines, you can always uh, add more pages and, and so forth, okay? So that's section two. Let's go to page, go back to page three. Page three at the top, it says part three, donation of organs. It says optional, but this is actually referred to uh, from the previous page from section 1.7 where it says agents post-death authority, which means that your agent, Sally uh, Brown, is able to donate organs on your behalf. So if you have, uh, if you have just experienced brain death, okay, so Sally can say, uh, Charlie Brown asked me to donate his organs, donate his heart, his liver, but not his eyes or whatever. You can, you can specify that here, okay? So there's a checkbox saying Charlie Brown did not want to donate any of his organs, okay? So you check that. Or actually, you would be the one to check that, sorry. You would be the one saying, I do not wish to donate any of my organs, okay? Or you can specify, I give any needed organs uh, or uh, certain tissues, parts, and so forth. So you can specify what that is. If you do not do this optional section, it's all up to Sally Brown, okay? If you trust her to make those decisions for you, you won't have to fill that out. But if you're particular about, I don't want to share my heart with anyone, please put down, I don't want, to, I don't want my heart to be uh, donated, okay? You can also uh, have your gift for a specific purpose, for transplants only, for therapy, research, education, so forth, okay? Or other limitations, is, um, there's a section for that. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. Part four, disposition of remains. Again, that was from section 1.7. So if you trust Sally Brown to make all your funeral arrangements for you with regards to your uh, remains and, and so forth, then uh, you won't have to do this part. But if you want to give specific instructions, for instance, I have a written contract for funeral services with, and if you have the name of a funeral director, you would put that down, or, or the name of a, a funeral place. Uh, you'll, in, a moment we'll, in a few moments, we'll have a talk from uh, Monica Lazo, which was from Forest Lawn, so she can kind of explain more in detail what that is. So if you have something, you have made arrangements with them already, that would be the place to put it, okay? My will, which I keep, um, so this, I would talk to Maurice Kane, okay? That's more of a legal thing, so I don't want to get into that. If you have questions with that uh, on uh, 4.2b, please ask Maurice with that. 
Um, and then instructions as follows. If you have uh, special instructions, that would go there. Part five, HIPAA disclosure authorization. Okay, this was a uh, act that was passed by Congress in 1996, and it's called the Health, Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. So it, it, it was created for a number of uh, reasons, but for our purposes, uh, for our purposes just for this document, it is more about privacy regulations that require the protection and confidential handling of our protected health information. So basically, I'll, I'll just summarize what 5.1 means. It means that you are, um, you understand that Sally Brown and your all alternate agents have the ability to request, review, and receive any information, whether verbal or written, uh, regarding my physical or mental health. So if there's a patient chart, they will have the ability to request that information saying what's going on with uh, Charlie Brown here. And they are able to receive that healthcare information. Um, so if you don't want to share any of your healthcare information to your agents, pick different agents, okay? If you don't, you're embarrassed about your hernia injury, your surgery, whatever, you don't want people to find out about it, as a simple example, then pick, please pick an agent that you're comfortable knowing that information, okay? And 5.2 is, uh, is basically saying that this is effective immediately the moment you sign this document, even though you might not be uh, unconscious, okay? There's no limitation on that. It means right now, the moment you sign this, it becomes in effect by law, okay? So part six, revocation of uh, prior directives. Revocation of prior appointments. So if you find out that Sally is not the best match for you, you find out that she's changed religions and doesn't want to practice uh, Catholic teaching regarding euthanasia and you want to change her, okay, then you would make a completely new document, okay? Get a clean new document, fill it out, and, and, and then change that agent's name so that, um, and the moment you do that, okay, and you sign this, your new document becomes the new one, okay? The old one is revoked automatically, and this becomes the new current legal document. So the only tricky part about that is you also have to have part seven. Uh, part seven is your signature, okay? So date, name, your signature. Let's go to page four. On 7.3, you have a section that says statement of witnesses. So you have two options here. You can get the signatures of two witnesses, or if you don't have friends, you can get go and go to, uh, you know, I don't know if you don't if you don't want to, you can go to a notary public and get that notarized. So you don't have you do not have to do both. You, you can do one or the other. You do not need both. So under current California law, uh, either of these uh, is sufficient, except with a certain exception, which I'll talk about in a bit. Okay, so part eight is kind of self-explanatory to the notary public. They will fill that out. You don't have to worry about that part. Part 7.3, you will have to find a witness, okay? They can be a family member. Uh, however, um, it's advisable not to, but the second witness should not be a family member at all, okay? They have to be sort of like a neutral party who will not benefit upon your death or is part of your living trust or state planning and so forth. It kind of makes sense, right? Okay, so that they have no uh, extra vested interest in your demise, okay? So you want to pick someone that is a new, sort of a neutral party, but someone that you do know, okay? A friend is fine. Um, so one person can be a family member. Uh, one person should not be a family member. And both of them should not be, uh, I believe there are, uh, it gives more details, it's not part of your a healthcare provider, an employer of your healthcare pro provider, an operator of a care facility, and so forth. The, the extra uh, details are here, okay? So my first witness would be Snoopy. My second witness is Woodstock, okay? <laughs> I chose them as my witnesses, okay? So when you, when you decide to revoke your, any of your other agents or another witness, you have to do this whole form all over again and, and get, the, you can do this, uh, you know, pick the witnesses and the agents and fill it out and then sign and date it, okay? Part nine, special witness requirement, okay? Um, if I can just have a show of hands if anyone has anyone that's in a skilled nursing facility. Okay, 
So I'd be happy to answer any questions regarding that afterwards, because uh, I'm taking up a lot of Monica's time, so forgive me for that. Um, so that's a special section uh, I can talk to you, or you can ask Maurice Kane uh, regarding that. So this part, again, is the space, the extra space, from, and it tells you what sections they are from. And the bottom here, OK, this is kind of the legalese. So California law permits photocopies of this document. You can actually make copies of this, and they are just as valued. Uh, they're just as valid as the original that you write in, in print. Uh, preferably, you should do this in ink, OK? Um, we're doing this in pencil because it's more of a draft, so you, a working draft for you guys. Um, and make sure you give a copy to your agent. So make sure Sally Brown, Peppermint Patty, and Linus have a copy of this document, okay, from front to back. And give one to your doctor, your primary physician. Give one to any significant members of your family, your spouse, your mom, dad, or, or so forth and any other person that you might consider to be your emergency contact. They should have a, a, a copy of this, okay? And you should also write down somewhere, okay, of a record of the persons who have received a copy of this. So that someone later on might say, your, your cousin Al might say, hey, Charlie Brown wanted me to be an agent and I, here's a copy here. But you'll, ha you'll have to have that document saying, I never gave a copy to uh, Cousin Al, OK? Because he might come and say, I, I know I, I'm in, I have his best interest at heart. Here's my copy. No, so you should keep a copy <coughs> for your protection that of, of all the people that you have uh, given this to, OK? And then sign it, date it, and, and so forth. OK, once again, the last page is a checklist. Uh, we won't go through this, but this is a handy checklist to see uh, as you're filling out the document, make sure you go through the checklist and mark a checkbox for all of the items that, are, uh, that you have covered so that you don't miss uh, anything at all, OK? Do I have any questions? But uh, please don't ask anything about uh, healthcare scenarios, OK? Just general questions regarding this document. Uh, yes. Yeah, so I don't have the direct link, but just go to Google, OK, google.com. Type in the, the keywords LA, LA space, Archdiocese, Advanced Healthcare Directive. And it'll be the very first link. It's a PDF file. And then the link uh, to uh, the other sections that I mean? So oh, that, go to the St. Louis website, stlouisdm.org. DM stands for Dermarelax, so it's, it's abbreviation. And the last question. Yes. That, that's considered an excessive financial burden on the family. But if that person doesn't get the care, will die. Does it mean that's okay? Well, in terms of church teaching, you're not morally obligated to receive that care. Okay? That, that's what that means. You're not morally obligated to receive that care. If you have no other means to receive it, if the state can give it through Medicare or, you know, um, some other form of government assistance, of course, so you should receive it, okay? But if it's going to, if the only way you can receive it is through your family, and that's going to cause them to be bankrupt, and they're all going to be out in the street the next day, no, the church does not require your family to be out in the street to save your life, okay? If they want to do that, they can, but you're not morally, morally obligated to do that, okay? It's extreme. Yeah, uh, Father, that's an extreme case, about yes. About the primary appointment or, you know, yes. Do they need to be a legal resident of California? Because it doesn't say that over here. Um, or of the United States, in case you have most of your relatives abroad. I would ask Maurice Kane that question. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I would think that they do. Well, it does say, um, yeah, in terms of the agent, no. But for you, it says, I, I, I am a California resident who is 18. Yeah. So I would assume yeah. that the agent should be as well. Okay. Uh, but I would double check with Maurice on that. It's a legal thing. So. I, Thank you. Good question, though. If, yes. If you get at something uh, authorized by another republic, yes. you don't have to get more witnesses? Than no, you don't need any witnesses at all if you go through the notary republic. Okay. Uh, notary public. Yeah. Thank you. Because yeah, they're, uh, they're illegally trusted, and you only need that one notary uh, signature. 
Okay. But they do have a fee, so <laughs> witnesses don't cost anything. Maybe lunch, but <laughs> okay. Okay, any other questions? If you have any questions regarding healthcare specific, I'd be happy to answer you after the workshop uh, individually. Okay, thank you. So at this time, I'd like to introduce Monica Lasso, who is, uh, has a wonderful presentation for us. So, okay. Hello, everybody. My name is Monica Lasso, and um, just wanted to give you a little bit of feedback about me. I have been here in the community in the parish for about 14 years now. My son Jeremy and Robbie went to school here, so I've been a parishioner just like you. I also um, i am a Eucharist minister here. My uh, boys are actually, Robbie is right now in the first year of confirmation. And as you know, if you've been taking care of them for a while. So um, the reason for, my, my, for me being here is because I wanted to, um, go ahead. I wanted to um, give you my journey when um, I was faced on um, planning my mom's funeral. And as if anybody here has planned a funeral, it is one of the most difficult things that you can go through. Um, my mom, typical Mexican, did not want to talk about funerals, did not want to talk about uh, ever dying. And uh, she had a lengthy, lengthy um, um, health issues. And uh, so we were always taking care of her instead of um, planning for what will happen when the time came. Therefore, when uh, the actual time came, uh, we were completely unprepared and unaware of all the difficult tasks that we had to make. And that was uh, pretty difficult for us in our family. Um, um, some of our family members wanted to cremate. I knew how afraid she was of uh, the fire, so I said, we can't do that to mom. So it was very conflicting in the family at that time. Now, 10 years later, um, I um, got a job at one of the local um, cemeteries and mortuaries, and I became aware of all of the decisions can be pre-planned. Everything can be pre-planned. And I'm like, oh my God, if I had none of this, then what a relief for my family and for all of us it would have been. Now, there's a lot of decisions to, make, to be made when the time comes. And most of the time, people don't even spend five minutes talking about these things. So there's um, decisions to be made. And um, if you sit down and talk to your family about your wishes, um, you can at least let them know what you want, what, what it is that you will want for your funeral, whether it's a traditional burial, whether it's a cremation. Um, if you have cemetery property or you don't, so that way they will be aware of those is, this is issues too. What type of service you would like to talk about? I mean, to have um, a visitation, obviously a rosary, a funeral mass. Uh, the grave site, all of those things need to be discussed in order for them to know exactly what you want. Um, there's also financial details, legal details, as we already discussed right now. Um, the, um, discuss about life insurance. Some people don't even know that their parents have life insurance, or our kids don't know this. So it's very important that they know these things. Uh, there's also final expense insurance that we can uh, give you information about that. All of the cemeteries and funeral homes have all this information, whether you are um, going to be at a Catholic cemetery or any other cemetery in the area, they will give you all that information. Um, a will or a trust, if it's not in place, it's a good thing to have. Most people um, with small children especially will need these things in place. Um, power of attorney. Who will be in charge of the power of attorney? Where is the power of attorney? All of these things are vital information as well as um, I just met with a family and yesterday and uh, they didn't know, they couldn't remember where their parents were born. That is information that you will be needing for your uh, death certificate. And when um, we, um, at our, our cemetery, when we uh, receive your loved ones, 
Within 24 hours, we need to have all this information in order for us to file a death certificate. It has to be within 24 hours. So you don't want to be going through all of these things on the worst day of your life. So it is very important to have this talk. Start the talk, at least, okay? Um, there's also um, education information that needs to be um, on the a death certificate. And uh, for all of those uh, veterans and people that were in the military, there are some uh, benefits that they have, and we can give you the information about that. You could also go to the veterans' uh, website, and they will give you more information about that. So those things are very important for you to know because a lot of veterans think that they have benefits that they actually don't. Mm -hmm. So it's very important to you, for you to be aware of everything that you do or don't have. Um, there's a lot of advantages for pre-planning. One of the advantages that is, is that if you go to a funeral home or a cemetery, they will have something like this, which is called a final wishes organizer. I didn't give one to all of you because some cemeteries and funerals have um, different um, formats. But our format where I work, we have a detail um, sheet that gives you all of the information that you will be needing at that time. It is right here. Now, if you go to any cemetery, mortuary, and they don't have something like this, please give me a call and I will sit down with you and get it ready for you. Um, once you get home, just um, look at, at this pamphlet. It has so much information. If I had had this when my mom passed, I would have been so well prepared for it. You are never going to be completely prepared because your loved one is a very difficult thing to have them passing, but at least you will be prepared, okay? If you pre-plan, um, you can uh, figure out about the property and about the services, everything that needs to be done. You can personalize this as you want. Sometimes people come to us and they're grieving and they're in pain and they feel that they didn't do enough for their loved ones. They overspend. And there's no need for that. If you sit down and write exactly what you want in detail, then your loved ones can just follow whatever it is that you want. They don't have to overspend. People say, oh my God, um, dying is so expensive. Doesn't have to be. Okay, so when you do this, you relieve the pressure and the burden on your families. And that way, when the time does come, because it will, then they will have time to just gather together and begin the healing. There's no reason for them to be taking care of this at that time. Now, how do you want to be remembered? If you plan your funeral, they will know exactly what kind of funeral you wanted, how you want to be remembered, what it is that was important to you. But there's no way for them to know this if you don't tell them. Mm -hmm. Now, what I did after um, what I went through with my mom, I sat down as soon as I became <laughs> an employee of uh, the place where I work at. I did everything in detail. And I'm giving this as to my kids because I don't ever want them to go through what I went through. It is a very, very difficult time. So I have um, exactly what casket I want, where I want to be laid to rest. Fortunately for me that when I did the arrangements for my mom, um, the plot right next to her was available, so I purchased it. So my, when Mother's Day comes, my, bro, my kids will be able to see grandma and me at the same time. <laughs> we'll be right there. No need to drive from one uh, cemetery to the next. Um, we planned for so many things in our lives. We plan for how many kids we're going to have, when are we going to get married, where are we going to go on vacation. But this is the most important thing that we do not plan for. And really, if we just sit down and talk about it with our family members for an afternoon, we will never have to talk about it again. Now, if we wait to the time when we need this, there's anywhere from 95 to 125 different items that have to be discussed. 
and it will take usually about five hours for you to sit down at the cemetery with us. Now, this is just a few of the things that, that they need to be discussed. Um, what type of casket? Do you want uh, an urn instead because you want to be cremated? I met with somebody yesterday that she found out that her mom did not want to be in pink. She does not want pink. <laughs> and she likes roses. She likes lavender roses. These things that, this is a 42-year-old woman that didn't know what that was about. Now, those are the things that she's going to have to try and figure out at the time. The type of music, the priest that, 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 will, that, um, that will be there, um, the chapel, whether they want to do it at a chapel or, or, or come back to their church. Um, Bible verses, that is so important, you know, because for me, I had to sit down and figure out what was my mom's favorite verse. So I did that for my kids. Um, the gravestone, I had to design. You saw my mom's gravestone. I designed that for her. You can design your own. What kind of clothing? That was one of the most difficult things for me to go and figure out what my mom was going to wear that day. And I don't know for you gentlemen, it's not a thing to do, but for us women, it's very important what we're going to be wearing that day. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the reception, where you're going to be uh, gathering, the memorial tributes, going through pictures on that day is very difficult. Um, at my office, what we do is you bring us the pictures, we refinish them if they need to be refinished, we make a montage and we put it on video so that all of your uh, relatives will be able to see it on video and you will take a book with you as well. So that is one of the things that are very, very um, nice about this uh, special tributes that you will be able to do. Now, the military honors, we do need to, even if you're um, in the military, you have to go and get that schedule, and it takes time for that. So we need to find out how long it will take for that as well. Um, at that time, there is so many things in your head that you don't think about every single person in your family, especially the ones that live out of state, out of the country, um, especially if um, mom has a special group or um, an organization that they gather once a week or once a month. You don't know all of those people. So um, with it, there is um, a space in this um, final wishes organizer that will give information about all of those people that your family members might not know. So to me, this was one of the most important things that if I had known about this organizer, my life that day would have been completely different. And I'm sure that my mother's funeral would have reflect who she was or who she wanted to reflect. I did the best that I can, but if you have this, go out to your cemetery, whichever one that is, if you already have one, go to any funeral home in the area and ask them to help you get this done so that with this, you will be able to honor your loved ones or you can give this to your children. Like I said before, I've given this a lot of thought ever since then, and I have planned everything from the moment that I pass. My, my kids will only have to pick up the phone, call uh, Forest Lawn, which is where I'm gonna be, and um, they have everything. They have everything in detail. They have the music, the flowers, what I'm gonna be wearing, everything is going to be there. Now, what a care gift. That's exactly what this lady said yesterday. Uh, as we were sitting with her mom. She's like, Mom, I totally appreciate you doing this for me. Now, on the other hand, I also was called late at night to work with a different family that unfortunately is in hospice. And her husband is in a situation where he doesn't have the funds for it. And they don't want her to be cremated, but that was the only option that they have. Now, it doesn't have to be that way. Cremated or, or, or buried, it can all be done as long as you do it in advance, as long as you have a plan for it. It's all possible. I am going to be in the back. If you have any questions or if you uh, would like me to give you a call or I will give you my business card, you can ask me anything. But go to any cemetery go to any um, um, mortuary and find out what this will 
be looking for in the future for you. And uh, thank you again for letting me be of service. I appreciate your time. And you guys have a wonderful day. Mm -hmm. Oh. Monica, I think you brought something. Oh, thank you. Okay. Um, Brothers and sisters, what you have in front of you here is what we as church have for you also. What we're looking for, um, the, um, the information that we're asking assists our presiders here. Um, one of the things that I, I wanted to share with you is how we here at St. Louis handle those calls that come in for funerals. The uh, first thing that that's done, people call here, and, and please do feel free to call here. And, and the reason for that, number one, so we can actually, you know, just begin praying for the healing of your family during this difficult time. But what has to happen is that we do need to make sure that we get in contact with the mortuary. The mortuary usually gives us a call. And what they're wanting to do right away is get a date. But we have to be sure that our presiders are available. Again, here we only have two presiders. So we want to make sure that they are available. So we will get that information. They usually give us a couple dates. We check with our presiders. And then we will go ahead and begin that process of getting you on calendar and making sure um, that is taken care of. Then we have what we call our funeral coordinator. They will then be getting in touch with you. They set an appointment with you so that they can go over, as she said, the readings, the music, all of that information. Um, but again, working with the um, mortuaries. What's happening and what we're finding a lot of right now is that the people are wanting to cremate, which is fine, but they don't want to wait for the remains. They want to have a funeral right away. We cannot have a funeral mass without the remains of your loved one. So it takes approximately, what we're finding out, a week to two weeks in order to get those cremated remains back. So what we're asking is if you would just wait until that time, then we will go ahead and get it. Go ahead, Monica. On the premises. Okay, so if your mortuary has um, the crematory on site, then that will expedite that process. But it's important as Catholics, and we've had to do some some conversations with um, the parishioners um, about why it's important to have that funeral mass, because as Catholics, that's what we knew. The the Paschal candle will be present. The the holy water, the blessing of the body, that is why it's it's the send off. The last time that we will be present with our loved ones in the church with that body before we send them off. So it's important that we remember that even though that a person will be cremated, that we do need those cremated remains. Um, th there's a term that we're be that is being used. We want to have a memorial mass. The memorial mass is usually on a, the anniversary of one's uh, death, OK? Then we'll have that memorial mass here. But again, as when your loved one dies, we want to have that funeral mass. So that's why, you know, we, I know the family. Share with the family, OK, when we get the body, you know, this is what we'll do. How long, Monica, does it usually take for um, them to prepare a body in a casket? It usually takes just a couple of days, okay. again. Um, we at Forest Lawn, we have our own crematory, mm -hmm. but there's other places that they don't, so we will have to schedule that. Okay, and if it's going to be a body in a casket, what is the time frame on that? Approximately usually a couple of days. A couple well. days, okay. Yeah. So, so that's that's what we're we are trying to educate the faithful on is the funeral mass, Father. That has the Paschal candle. We have the holy water, the incense the receiving of the body, and then the send off of the body. And that's, that's what we do. And that's why we are really encouraging that, making sure that everyone has that knowledge as why we're waiting for um, the body. So what we have here, actually, you, you also have this information here. It's, this is from the Archdiocesan website, the Catholic Funeral Rites and Customs. It explains the vigil, has the rosary, the, the um, funeral liturgy, the committal, what to do when a loved one dies, 
and what is involved in the funeral preparation. We have approximately four to five funeral coordinators who actually will be meeting with you. Uh, do we have a couple here now? I don't have my glasses on. Yes, we have one, two, we have three. Three of our funeral coordinators are present here today. They will be giving you a call, setting all that information up with you, having you fill this out. You know, and the reason, again, why we fill out this bio sheet is so that our presiders know just a little bit more about your loved one, especially if they're, they weren't real active in the parish, okay? So um, do you have any questions on uh, anything regarding the funeral that happens here at the church, how you go about making those arrangements? Yes? You can. Yes, you can. Mm -hmm. They have. You can rent the caskets. Is that correct? Do they do that? Not at Forest Line. I know that what uh, it, what you can do is the body can be brought forward for a funeral mass, and then they will take. I know Kathy, uh, one of our parishioners here, had that done, and what she did is she presented her father father for her funeral mass. Then the body was taken and then the, um, the body was then cremated, and then the family had a private committal later on at the cemetery. So yes, that can be done. Okay, yes, okay, yes. Um, does a Catholic have to be buried in a Catholic cemetery? Well, no, the, no, but that's why when you have the committal, does a Catholic have to be buried in a Catholic cemetery? No, they do not, but at the committal, the grave site is blessed. Is that correct, Father? With, um, th there's holy water, yes. It's blessed with holy water, yes. Same thing with putting them in a niche, okay? If it's uh, crema uh, the cremated remains. Any other questions on, yes? I have a question. Um, there is a chapel at a Catholic cemetery that my parents made in 1960. Yes. Will the priest go off site to perform the funeral mass? Yes, that we have, there's five different cemeteries, uh, Holy Cross in Pomona, the uh, Queen of Heaven in Roland Heights. Oh, mm -hmm. And um, those are the local ones that we do here. If it's Resurrection or Calvary, they usually have somebody within that local area that would go there.